Hi Bookish Besties, my name is Brittany. This is Ruskies and Reads. Thank you so much for joining me here today. If you are new, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. And if you're already subscribed, as always, I appreciate your continued support. Thank you for returning to another video. Today it is time to do my July reading roundup. <music> This is a type of wrap up that I do at the end of every month that kind of incorporates a few things. I'm going to talk about my tops and bottoms for the month as well as quickly run through everything else that I read. I will talk about some bookish stats. I will do my haul and unhaul for the month and then at the very end we will balance the books to make sure that my physical TBR is going down which is the direction that I want it to go. Now for the month of July my reading definitely slowed down. I only read a total of about 13 books for the month of July which I think is one of the lowest amounts that I've read so far this year and that wasn't just because I was coming off of the amazing readathon and I allowed myself to slow down a little bit but also I feel like all of the books that I read were on the longer side like the vast majority of audiobooks that I listened to were over 12 to 13 hours so every single time I was picking up an audiobook I knew that was going to take me a couple of days to complete rather than just in one or two so my reading definitely slowed down but I do feel like I had a lot of really interesting and memorable reads so I'm pretty satisfied with my reading for the month of July and speaking of memorable reads I want to go ahead and jump into my tops for the month. And two of my tops are actually the two non-traditional books that I read for the month of August. So first I have Hamilton the Revolution, which was written by Lin-Manuel Miranda and Jeremy McCarter. This is actually a behind the scenes look at the development of the Broadway play Hamilton and scattered throughout here are also all of the lyrics for all of the songs with annotations by Lin-Manuel Miranda. I actually picked this up in the Strand Bookstore in New York City. It was the only book that I purchased there, but I figured how appropriate to go ahead and purchase this book from New York. I watched Hamilton for the very first time in 2022 when it came to New Orleans and it was my very first Broadway show and I am not exaggerating when I tell you that that show absolutely changed my life. I cannot even express to you the brilliance of that Broadway show and this book I feel like really only scratches the surface of absolutely everything that went into the creation of Hamilton. So what I did was I immersively read this and for the text portions I listened to the audiobook but when it came time to the songs I actually pulled up the songs and listened listened to the Broadway songs while reading his annotations. All right, so it's gonna be kind of hard for me to fit this all in frame, but here is definitely my favorite character of the whole musical, that is King George. And so you can see the lyrics here. And in this instance, it's definitely simple because it's only King George singing, but there are a lot more complicated layouts for how a lot of the songs are formatted. And then over here, you have Lin-Manuel Miranda's annotations. And I cannot even express to you what an amazing reading experience this was. Reading the book, seeing all the behind the scenes and listening to the songs that I love so dearly and hearing Lin-Manuel Miranda's thoughts and the process processes that went into creating the songs, I could not feature this in the tops for July because this lived rent free in my head all month. I consistently had Hamilton songs stuck in my head and all of the facts and stuff that I was learning about the musical and Hamilton's life. This was a five star experience. I do not rate nonfiction, but this was definitely a five star experience. Another non-traditional book that I read in the month of July was Tiny But Mighty, Kitten Lady's Guide to Saving the Most Vulnerable Felines by Hannah Shaw. Now, if you're not familiar, Hannah Shaw is also known as the Kitten Lady. She has a vast following on Instagram and YouTube. She has millions and millions of followers and she has basically dedicated the last 15 years of her life to cat rescue, primarily neonatal cats under six to eight weeks of age who are not weaned and who need a lot of additional care. Hannah Shaw is ultimately living my dream life, my dream career. If you are not familiar, I'm a huge animal advocate and a huge advocate for rescue. Ultimately, I would like to have my own rescue someday where I too specialize in neonatal kittens and senior dogs who are having a hard time getting adopted. And I knew that this was going to be a valuable resource for me. Now, I didn't read this book cover to cover because a lot of the sections are reference sections that you really only read when you need them. But I did read several of the sections. This was incredibly comprehensive. It was also very well written and it was narrated by Hannah herself. And it's full of anecdotes from her time in kitten rescue, which were very helpful and very applicable and really kind of helped cement some of the principles that she was talking about. And one of the main things I learned from this book that I wanted to share with you all, because of the lack of resources available for neonatal kittens, they are the most highly euthanized animal population within shelters because shelters just cannot care for them because they need like feedings every two hours, they definitely need a lot of additional care and attention. And so what Hannah mentions in here is if you are out there in the wild and you see baby kittens who look like they're not old enough to live on their own, do not immediately pick them up, take them to a shelter thinking that you're helping them because you're not. Chances are those babies are going to be euthanized if they are not able to find a foster parent. Instead, she recommends first waiting for a couple of hours to see if their mama returns because ultimately the best thing to care for those babies is their mama. And if you wait a couple of hours and the mama still hasn't returned, 
learned and you want to help the kittens, the best thing is going to be for you to take in and help those kittens themselves or make sure that somebody else can take care of them because people think that they're helping when they're picking up these baby kittens that they're finding out there in public and unfortunately they're just not. There are so many neonatal kittens that are killed in shelters every single year because shelters just cannot take care of them. So needless to say, I found this an incredibly valuable resource. I enjoyed everything that I read. I will certainly be keeping this around for when I absolutely need to reference it and I highly recommend if you are interested in rescue or even if you're just interested in kitten care in general because there's a lot of really important information on all stages of kitten life in general in here and I just found it very very helpful. So I wanted to go ahead and spotlight it here even though I know it's not going to be relevant to probably anybody else who watches my channel. And in terms of bottoms I really didn't have any. I didn't really read anything egregiously bad in August. I didn't rate anything below three stars. I did have some meh reads or reads that I had higher expectations for but for the most part nothing really bad so I don't think I'm going to include any bottoms here. But in terms of what else I read for the month first I read The Family Remains by Lisa Jewell and I very much enjoyed this one. This was a solid four stars. I love Lisa Jewell. She can almost do no wrong for me but The Family Upstairs which was the book before this book really didn't hit for me like a lot of the other Lisa Jewell books that I've read. Now I think that might have been a me thing though more than a book thing just because I was reading that during a very distracting point in my life and I wasn't really paying attention as well as I should have to that book. But I did pick this up and I'm thankful to say that I loved this one. I thought that this was a very solid follow-up and I enjoyed this one way more than The Family Upstairs. So this was a solid four stars and I highly recommend if you didn't like The Family Upstairs either to pick this one up. I of course also read Middle of the Night by Riley Sager. Middle of the Night was middle of the road for me in terms of Riley Sager. I ultimately gave it like a four stars but probably more of a 3.5. It definitely wasn't his best but it certainly wasn't his worst. This was definitely on the more character driven slow burn side. Not a whole heck of a lot happens for the majority of this book. It's very much all about the characters and the vibes and I would say this one is less twisty than some of his more recent releases. So I really did enjoy this one. I don't really have any problems with it. It just wasn't as good to me as some of his other releases. I also read The Honey Witch by Sydney J. Shields and unfortunately this was a three stars. This is one of those books that I had a lot higher expectations for and it was just really okay. It didn't do a whole lot for me. I had a lot of technical issues with it. I probably will keep this because I mean look at it. It is just absolutely beyond stunning but I just didn't care for the story. I also read Becoming Family by Alicia Whistler. This is the third and final book in her Dogwood County series. This is a series that literally nobody knows about but I happened to receive the first book in a book subscription service that I was trying I think about like three years ago and I very much enjoyed the first book because it featured older main characters and the other two books kind of follow the same and all of the books in some way featured dogs because one of the main characters has like a dog rescue. Are these the most well-written stories? No they're not but I appreciate the overall story and the characters so I did want to pick this up so I could have a completed trilogy. Then I read Bright Young Women by Jessica Knoll. I'm not going to say anything regarding my feelings about this one because this is for the project I'm doing where I'm reading the books that Sarah recommended to me but this is the first one that I read for that. I also picked up A Talent for Murder by Peter Swanson and this was fine. It was like three stars. It was okay. It was a good time while I was reading it but I've absolutely completely forgotten everything about it so it will certainly not stay in my memory. Then I picked up The Book of Two Ways by Jodi Picot. I'm not going to say a whole lot because I wrote a novel length review about this book on Goodreads. This was messy. Y'all there was a lot of messy relationships happening in this. There are some choices that our main character makes that are going to frustrate you. They're going to make you angry. This does involve cheating but it's very nuanced at the same time. I gave it a solid four stars. As per usual with Jodi Picot this was incredibly well written, very well researched. There's a ton of Egyptology stuff in here y'all. Probably too much Egyptology stuff but for the most part I always leave a Jodi Picot with a really solid reading experience. Yeah just because of my complicated feelings I don't think I could give this any less than a four stars. I also ended up picking up Never Never by Colleen Hoover and Taryn Fisher. This was like absolute candy. You know it's something that you binge and you can't stop eating but it's not really good for you. It's not anything substantial and that's exactly what this is but I had a fantastic time with this one y'all. I had a great time and I gave this a 3.5 stars. I also was able to pick up Not In Love by Allie Hazelwood. I am surprised to say this but I actually really enjoyed this story. I was really worried because this is different than her Steminist novellas. This is far more of an erotic romance so there's way more sex, open door sex in this story than there are in her previous novels and I was concerned because typically that's basically just porn in a book but I found that there was actually quite a good plot in here and I do felt like you got a good amount of the characters together and individually in between all of the sex. Do I love having that much sex in a book? No just because there's like only so many ways that you can write a sex scene. It just gets old after a time but I feel like there was a good balance of sex and plot and character dynamics in here and I really enjoyed it so ultimately I would recommend this one. I definitely love this way more than Love on the Brain which was her second Steminist novel and I hated that one. There were so many problems I had with that book so I'm not sure what happened with Love on the Brain but thankfully I love this and I'm now completely willing to pick up more from Allie Hazelwood in the future. And the very last book that I read for the month of July was Bad Taurus by Carol Carver. This 
was just a good fun fast time. Nothing substantial at all. I gave it a three stars. I was actually quite entertained for the majority of the time that I was reading this story. But like I said, it's nothing that's going to stick with me. So three stars. All right, now let's quickly go through some of the monthly stats. So for the month of July, I read 13 books for a total of 4,444 pages. I did not include the Kitten Lady book in here just because like I said, I didn't read that from cover to cover. I did read a lot of sections, but not all of them. And I didn't keep track of how many pages I actually read. So I didn't incorporate that here. In terms of ratings, I had three three star reads, two 3.5 star reads, six four star reads, which is pretty good. And then the two nonfictions, which I did not rate. In terms of book type, 11 of them were standard novellas and two of them I'm classifying as reference because the Kitten Lady book is definitely a reference book. I would say Hamilton the Revolution is probably more of a coffee table book, but for the purposes of the spreadsheet, we're just going to go with reference. In terms of the format, 11 of them were listened to purely via audio and two of them were immersively read. All right, in terms of where I acquired the audiobooks, five of them were acquired from Audible, four of them were acquired from my library, two of them were acquired from Everrand, and two from Spotify. In terms of genre, there was actually a tie between contemporary and thriller, which I think is a little bit unusual because thriller typically far outweighs any other genre that I read. But in this instance, both of the categories were 38.5%. So we had a tie between contemporary and thriller. I read one fantasy, which accounted for 7.7% .7 of the genres for the month. And then the two reference books were nonfiction, and that was 15.4% of my reading. And that again is very unusual. I typically don't read nonfiction, and even these are not traditional nonfiction. You know, they're reference or coffee table books that I had on my TBR, and I thought, what the heck, I'm just gonna go ahead and read them and get them off of my TBR. And I'm very glad I did. I didn't have anything else that I was reading immersively, and so it was the perfect opportunity for me to go ahead and do it and kind of give my brain a break because I didn't necessarily have to super concentrate on both of the books and try to follow like a complex fantasy plot or anything like that. So these two books worked out very well for my reading mood in the month of July. In terms of age range, 12 of the books that I read were targeted towards an adult audience. And then the Colleen Hoover, Taryn Fisher book was geared more towards a young adult slash new adult audience. I did put it as new adult as both the main characters in here were like 18 years old and it felt a little bit more older than YA. So that's where I placed it. And then in terms of author status, six of the authors were new to me, which accounted for 46.2% of my reading. And then seven of them were repeat authors, which accounted for 53.8% of my reading. All right, those are all the books that I read for the month of July. And those are my bookish stats. So now let's go ahead and get into the haul and the unhaul. But first, of course, we have to establish a baseline to see where my TBR ended up at the end of July. So after my July reading roundup, I had 29 physical books on my TBR. Out of the 13 books that I read for the month of July, seven of those books were already on my TBR prior to the start of the month. So now that brings my physical TBR from 29 down to 22. In terms of the book haul, the first book that I hauled for the month of July was The Dream Daughter by Diane Chamberlain. As soon as I knew what books I was reading for the Can I Trust Sarah project that I'm doing, I went ahead and ordered this. I just knew that I was going to love it and would want it on my shelf. So I picked this up. It is definitely being added to my TBR because I have not read this yet, but it will be read in August. Then I picked up God of the Woods for my July book of the month box. And I'm actually currently reading this book as we speak. So I'm not going to add this to my TBR because I will be finishing it in the next couple of days. And then in the same box in which I got God of the Woods, I also got Bad Tourist by Carol Carver, which of course I've already read. Same with Middle of the Night by Riley Sager and Bright Young Women by Jessica Knoll. So none of these books are actually being added to my TBR. I also picked up Life's Too Short by Abby Jimenez. This again for that project that I'm doing with Sarah from Sarah's Nightstand. And I actually just finished this yesterday. So this is not going on my TBR. Becoming Family was one that I also picked up in July after I had already read it because again, I wanted to have the completed trilogy on my shelves. So of course, this is not being added to my TBR. Same thing with The Book of Two Ways by Jodi Bico. I picked this up after I already read it because I just knew I had to have this one on my shelves with the other Jodi Bico that I owned. So again, not being added to my TBR. All right. And so this final haul book is actually the last book that arrived in my July book of the month box, but I'm talking about it here as both a haul and an unhaul. All the Colors of the Dark by Chris Whitaker. I cannot tell you how surprised I am that I plan on unhauling this book without completing it. I thought that this book was 100% going to be up my alley. The synopsis of it, the vibes of it, I thought that this was going to be absolute perfection, but I started this the other day and I almost instantly disliked it. I disliked the writing style. I disliked the way that he was telling the story. And a lot of it is being told from the perspective of young teens at this point. I do believe that this spans many years. So obviously we are going to follow the kids as they grow up. I really don't connect with books that are written from a child's perspective. And on top of that, the way that this was written, I can't even tell you what it is about the way that this was written. I just did not connect to it. I could already tell that this book was going to severely meander. Like it is not small y'all, but I thought that every single page of this could have a purpose. And I just don't believe that to be the case. I don't know. I felt like a good two to 300 pages of this were not going to be necessary for the overall plot and feelings of the story. And so I didn't get very far in. I got only a few chapters in, but these chapters are short. They're only like two to 
to three pages each. Yeah, there are over 260 chapters in here and I actually disliked that. I felt like it made it a very jarring and disjointed reading experience because you weren't getting far into a perspective before it would change to the next chapter or to the next perspective. So there was a lot about this that I was not enjoying and I found myself almost instantaneously disconnected from the story. I didn't want to be listening to it. I wasn't looking forward to listening to it. I didn't retain anything that I was reading. So this book was like literally making me cranky at the idea of reading it. That's how much I was disliking my reading experience. So it was an easy DNF. I could not put myself through it. So I'm hauling it in this video, but I'm also unhauling it in this video. So of course it's not being added to my TBR. And similarly, I'm also hauling and unhauling the July Fairy Loot book, which was The Night Ends With Fire by KX Song. Unfortunately, Fairy Loot has a really ridiculous skipping policy. They only allow you to skip four boxes a year and you cannot skip back to back without contacting customer service. Otherwise, I would have absolutely skipped this. This is kind of like a Mulan retelling and I don't like retellings and I'm really not particularly interested in Mulan, even though, you know, I like the Disney film and all of that. I'm really just not interested in reading a Mulan retelling. So I got this knowing that I was instantly going to unhaul it. It, of course, is absolutely stunning. Look, I mean, look at that. I love that. There are the sprayed edges. This naked hardcover is stunning. So you have like the cool tone blues and purples on the dust jacket and then you have the warm reds, oranges, and yellows. I mean, this is certainly top tier, y'all. I have absolutely no complaints about how stunning this book is. And look at those end pages. Like there's gold foiling on them. So this is complete perfection. I absolutely love the design of it. Nothing against it. I just really have no interest in reading the story. So it's going to be going up on my pango. I'm also unhauling the fairy loot edition of A Fate Inked in Blood by Danielle L. Jensen. I started this book, y'all. I got about, I want to say 70 or 80 pages into it and I just really wasn't enjoying myself. It wasn't really anything that was holding my attention. I realized that I just didn't care about where it was going and I had no interest in continuing. So I'm going to go ahead and unhaul this. This is a fantasy based around like Norse mythology and I know a lot of people have really, really enjoyed it. And I know that there's going to be somebody out there super excited to get their hands on this one. So this is going to go. All right. And this final book is being unhauled for my TBR, but not my physical space. And that is Forging Silver into Stars by Bridget Kemmerer. Now I actually love Bridget Kemmerer. I have really enjoyed everything that I've read by her and I absolutely love the A Curse of Dark and Lonely trilogy. And that is the same world in which this book is set. And I should have read the synopsis of this better because I thought that this was a prequel series or a series that was set in the same world and completely followed all different characters with none of the same characters involved. But that's not the case. This is not only set in the same world, but you have some of the same characters. They're not necessarily going to be main characters, but they're going to be within the story because like they're rulers and stuff within the story. And that's not what I was looking for. I really don't feel like there needed to be any type of continuation in this world. I was really happy with the trilogy and ultimately how it ended up, even though I definitely have thoughts and feelings. I have a lot of thoughts and feelings. So I was actually like reviewing some of my TBR books and I read the synopsis of this and I saw what it was about. And I was like, you know what? I just, I just don't know if I care. I was already on the fence about this one because even when I thought that it was a prequel, I didn't know how invested I was in the prequel for the series. And then I found out that it wasn't actually a prequel and all of my interest kind of drained away. But I do not want to get rid of this book because it has sentimental value because this is actually the one and only book that I picked up when I was book shopping with Sarah in Alexandria, Virginia. Me and my husband met up with Sarah and her husband and we went out to eat. We went exploring. We went to this small little bookshop. I found this and it was a great price because it's actually signed by Bridget Kemmerer. But this has just been sitting on my shelves for two years. I really had no inclination to pick it up. And now that I know that it's not a prequel, I'm less interested in picking it up. So I'm going to go ahead and put this on my shelves with my other Bridget Kemmerer collection for now. And maybe one day I'll unhaul it, but I don't think that I'm ready to unhaul this just yet. Oops. I actually found one more book that I need to unhaul and that is Shelterwood by Lisa Wingate, which unfortunately is another DNF because one of the major perspectives in this is the perspective of a child. I didn't care about anything that was happening in the child's perspective. I was really only interested in the present day perspective, which in this case was 1990, followed like a park ranger. There had been a body in the park found and I really wanted to just follow her. But every time it switched back to the child's perspective, I just disconnected. I just also didn't like the tone of the child and the way that she spoke and, and all of that stuff. So I disengaged with this one pretty fast as well. This was also a pretty easy DNF. All right, so since we were at the end of the haul and some of those last books were hauls and unhauls, I realized that I didn't actually stop to check in to let you know how many of the hauled books were being added to my TBR. And it was actually only one, The Dream Daughter by Diane Chamberlain. All of the other books I had already read in the month of July or they are being unhauled, so they are not being added to my TBR. So that took the count from 22 to 23. Now, out of the books that I'm unhauling that were on my physical TBR, we had Shelterwood, we had the Danielle L. Jensen story and Forging Silver into Stars. And if my math is correct, that means my physical TBR is now down to about 20 books. I don't think I'm going to hit zero by the end of the year, but I'm certainly going to get as close to it as humanly possible. All right, I've been filming for about an hour, y'all. It took me way too long to film. 
film all of this. I'm going to have to try to make something out of this hot mess. If you have actually made it to the end of this video and you are not feeling chatty, go ahead and leave me some type of yellow emoji. I'm looking around and I actually have a lot of yellow books surrounding me right now. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I typically post two videos a week, one on Wednesdays, one on Sundays, and I would love to connect with you in any of those future videos or on any of my other social media platforms, which you can always find linked down below along with any books featured in the video. Until next time, y'all. Bye.